Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ask Us Anything panel. We're very excited for all your questions. So how about let's get started by just doing a quick round of intros on the team. Hi, uh, I'm Curtis Evely. Uh, you may remember me from the previous session. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm a senior software engineer on the MRTK and middleware team. Um, I've been working on the, the toolkit from you know Holographic Academy, Holo Toolkit days through MRTK2, uh, now to MRTK3. Um, and I spend a decent amount of my time these days thinking about kind of our a uh, whole development stack from sort of OpenXR and, and our integration into Unity, uh, and then how that all sort of you know feeds up into into MRTK3. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Max Wang. I joined Microsoft roughly uh, two years ago, and joined the same team as Curtis and the rest of the team working on MRTK. Um, my journey of MRTK started when MRTK was still called the Holo took it, but I was a user at that time. I have been a uh, HoloLens developer throughout my college years. Um, but then I got here and started working on the toolkits that I used to use. Um, so yeah, uh, regarding my uh, the things that I work on, I'm RTK3 specifically, I was working on keyboard slash uh, speech input side of things. Um, and I'll pass. Oh. Oh yeah, I do have my own mic. Hi guys, I'm Roger. Uh, I was also from the last session. I uh, worked a lot on our cross-platform support recently. So on our K2, one of the people who helped make sure that you know we had Quest working on that platform. Uh, for our K3, doing a lot of the same things. I uh, make sure you have Quest working on all sorts of other devices. Uh, so you can ask us most things, and uh, hopefully you have more than beyond just the range of our last talk, because um, it's open to anything. And I'm Grace Shu. I had a session yesterday with Brent Jackson. Uh, I'm the product manager for MRTK, and I love hearing from our customers, um, working on the pain points and the future roadmap with the engineers. Hey, welcome everybody. <clears throat> I'm Hoff. Um, I lead the MRTK team, and this is the most awesome team, honestly, I've ever had in my career, and I mean that with all genuine sincerity. And I feel like the luckiest man on the planet, and they make my job easy. Um, I started on this journey back in the early Holland uh, days, uh, right before launch, and was involved in like the NASA um, Mars Curiosity planning um, project called uh, Onsite, and also on the Trimble partnership and a couple of the Autodesk uh, partnerships for the Fusion 360 integration and then the Maya integration. So I uh, had a lot of early uh, experience with how to make this valuable to enterprise and what that actually means and what the value proposition even is. And then I uh, left the mothership to become one of the very first, uh, what now is called Mixed Reality Partner Program partners. Uh, back then it was called the Agency Readiness Program, Holland's Agency Readiness Program, where they nurtured seven agencies to uh, learn and, and support this industry and help figure out how to deploy solutions for it. And, and I, it was a company called Object Theory. I did that for um, five years and then I came back to the mothership, and so I'm back at the mothership and having the time of my life uh, leading the MRTK team. And uh, man, it's this team is magic, and I feel lucky and excited every single day. Thank you, Hoff. Yeah, we have a very talented group up here on stage today, so we'd love to hear you guys' questions. Oh, right here. Um, do we have a mic for him? Mic check, mic check. Okay, cool. Uh, I got a couple questions. One, I'll start off easy. How many people do you think are using MRTK right now? Like, do you have any metrics on that, or like how widespread is it? Because you know, with all these improvements, I'm expecting that number to just like go up, right? But like, as of right now, how many people would you say? Do you want to field it? I, I mean, right, can, <laughs> we can field it together. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm just, um, we, the biggest metric we have is how many people are downloading our, our stuff from GitHub. And, um, and then Hall Developers Channel obviously gives us a good signal on, on the actual uh, engagement as well as downloads. And I mean, you, you've probably tracked some of the numbers for MRTK2. We obviously are too early to have much numbers on, on three. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, not not specific numbers. I know. I mean, our, our yeah, our, our download counts like through the feature tool ha have been in the sort of t tens of thousands, I suppose. Uh, you know, some of those maybe you know resolving the same package on different machines, but um, it, it has tended to, to to trend pretty steadily around around those numbers. Yeah, I don't have the exact numbers yeah, in my sure. head, but I, I think we're talking. Yeah. yeah, I think we're talking like four or five digits. Um, is if you ha if we were to give a uh, scientific notation number, uh, that is our current significant <laughs> figures count or magnitude. Um, and then my second question is, um, like I, I I'm an MRTK newbie as well as some maybe some other people here, but obviously I've seen all these improvements and like they're great. But I'm wondering what's something on your feature roadmap that's just like so far away, but you really really want to get into people's hands, maybe for like MRTK4 even, right? Like thinking super far ahead, because we all your short-term stuff or near-term stuff, it's like very interesting and we're all here for it. But what's like, what's something that's not even close that you really want? So I have a long list, but I'm actually more interested in hearing what's on their list. Well, <laughs> I, I just want to first speak for one of the team members who is in here right now. Uh, David Klein is um, one of our um, biggest advocates for accessibility. And this is something that is going to be extremely important um, for the XR space um, coming into the future. So, you know, if in order for, you know, XR things to become more and more like, you know, commonplace and acceptable uses like phones, um, it has to be convenient. It has to be usable by people of all sorts of abilities. And that is definitely going to be one of the, you know, highlights that we're trying to really push forward. I wouldn't call that like a far, far out thing. It's definitely on our roadmap. Um, but I wish David was here because he would give a much more in, de in detail answer. I mean, anyone else want to speak on David's behalf for me? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm struggling to come up with. I feel like a satisfying answer for that because I, I mean, I feel like what, what I, what I, I am, I am looking at right now is probably still more, more short term. But just like uh, I, I like to live kind of in the platform support layer and just like seeing all of these new devices come up across the industry and and watching the OpenXR standard evolve and and luckily being a part of of of, uh, of the team here that that helps integrate that standard into Unity and and. Pipe, pipe it through the right APIs to get it up into MRTK. Um, just seeing that continue to evolve, it's both you know a, a short term and a, and a, a very much a journey as you know uh, new controllers or new methods of input sort of come online and and um, I'm just yeah excited to sort of think about the beginnings of you know what different forms of spatial input might might become in the future and. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a that's a very nebulous, like non concrete, and uh, answer. But um, that that's something that I'm just excited to see MRTK three, uh, just just be as many places as we can we can make it be. Yeah, one, <laughs> one, yeah. I just want to elaborate one more thing um, as far as like you know things that we're really looking forward to doing. Um, so um, we've had some things in the past, such as our hand solvers and you know just ways of intelligently placing holograms around the world around you. Um, and that's something that you know we had been working pretty heavily on in MRTK2. At one point, it got a little bit difficult to keep up with that, as well as all the other you know support um, things we had to do to make sure it was compatible across a lot of platforms. You know, just even handling input. Now that a lot of that stuff is kind of I wouldn't say offloaded, but standardized, and you know, piped through things like XRI and um, OpenXR, um, we believe that you know, with you know, I guess I wouldn't I would I wouldn't call it like newfound. Capacity, but um, you know, focusing more on you know how to make a you know UI and interact like world inside an AR or VR space you know more intuitive, like actually comfortable to use. Um, that's something I really hope we you know are able to noodle on. In addition to like accessibility things, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Just like as far as like you know, you look at an object and you want to say, hey, what kind of object this is, um, and make sure everyone is able to experience the world in the same way. I switch. I just uh, want to add something that is maybe even crazier. So uh, we are the MRTK team, and currently um, MRTK3 is targeting Unity, right? And But I know other, there are many different um, developers targeting other, for example, game engine as well, or other ways of like doing XR, for example, uh, Unreal, Babylon.js, and other things, uh, even native development. So I guess, uh, and SteroKit, 100%. And at least uh, for me personally, one of the potential North Star has always been, uh, you know, like if there's a day where uh, for all these platforms, we can have some of 
uh, some kind of offering that at its core shares the same logic, right? Uh, but but then in terms of fu functionality, it more or less has parity with each other. I guess that could be a very North Star type of goal that we are trying to hit. We are not there yet, and we don't really have a very concrete roadmap yet. But I think that's something that we have been thinking, we have been discussing, and will be, you know, one day when that is achieved, I, I feel like me and the whole team will be very happy. And I hope you guys are also very happy when that becomes the reality. And, and to expand on what Max was saying, I mean, we are um, thinking hard about what that even looks like. And probably the first baby step is the mixed reality design language to bring the aesthetic across all of those platforms. And I, I think that's a really important first step. And yeah, you know, obviously the the logic underneath the hood is is deployed to different languages and, and different operating systems. So that makes it a little bit more challenging. But absolutely, we, we're continuing to poke at that to try to figure out what those commonalities can be. Um, and one conceptual thing that I realized that I talk about a lot that feeds into your question, which is th this idea that um, you know we keep adding things that aren't yet in the engine, and and then Unity gets inspired by a lot by what we do, and they add it into Unity, and then we go up the and and one of the missions I have for our uh, for our team is that we keep moving up the value chain, right? Let let Unity take care of more of the basic plumbing so that we can add higher and higher value, and you know the. The data binding that that we have is is in that category. Like, what can we do that's a value above the basics? And um, so, so as MRTK three starts maturing, this, one of the motivations for separating out the different packages is so that we can introduce these new high value pieces, and they're one hundred percent independent. They they each work to meet a specific need, and you can deploy them independently, and they each build on what we already have. But they're not all intertwined. You're not, you're not like needing to sign up for all of MRTK three to benefit from these high value components that you know, get you to value faster. I mean, uh, time to value is, is is a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, for, for my list, probably the thing that I know is really important that I would love to see us do relatively soon, and you know we don't know yet when. Um, for enterprise, this is where having been out there trying to actually build things for enterprise, you learn a lot about what the actual needs are. And everybody, everybody building for production needs to, their app to run, well, unless it's very specific niches. But a lot of them need to run on 3D devices and 2D devices. They need to run on a HoloLens and an iPad. And, and, and that's because they need to be where the devices are. And almost everything is collaborative in enterprise. And whether it's collaborative in a small way or in a big way, you need to be able to invite everybody to the to the conversation. And if any single one of them doesn't have the, the, the device you support, you're not really able to, to to unlock the value of that of that solution, and so you know iPads are everywhere. So that typically is the one that they go shoot for first because of its ubiquity, um, and so that that drives this need to create UX that can run in 2D and 3D, which we all know is hard to do. Um, and so one of the things that I think of is like, well, what does responsive design look like in this 3D plus 2D world? You know, what does it mean to have a, a slate that's asking you questions? You know, what, you know, what's your first name? What's your last name? Uh, and now you're running on 2D device and you have to like navigate to, a, <laughs> to this slate that's somewhere out there in the 3D world? No, it should, when you put that slate out there, it should say, oh, I'm running on a 2D device. Bling! It snaps to 2D space, screen space, and does the exact same thing. But but you, as the developer, did not have to make that happen. It just knew, because it was on 2D device, that that should be part of its behavior. And those are the kinds of responsive design capabilities between 2D and 3D that I think can unlock a, a faster time to value for everybody deploying you know, production level solutions. So that that's probably at the top of my long list of, of things. And I think I'll stop there, because I think that that is something we can achieve in the relatively short short time frame. Yeah. Awesome. I have questions from the chat from our Learn Live community. Um, first one is, for spatial mapping using OpenXR, how would one pull and save meshes in runtime, either via AR Foundation or OpenXR Exten Open Extension APIs? Uh, yeah, so there there are a couple ways you can go about that. Um, one is you know AR Foundation if you just want to uh, you know drag the AR Mesh Manager into your scene, um, uh, and uh, you know set set the the mesh prefab, and that's you know basically all you need to do is you know, you, you make sure the mixed reality features is is checked in the OpenXR settings. But um, yeah, we we make sure to pipe 
all of our meshing data and all of our planes data uh, through the Unity APIs so that we get the, the added value of going all the way up through AR Foundation. Um, if you don't want to use specifically AR Foundation, you kind of want to manage the creation and lifecycle of the meshes a little bit more. Um, specifically, you can talk directly to the XR mesh subsystem itself, uh, which is you know really what the AR mesh manager is built on. Um, and, and also what we built our MRTK2 uh, spatial mapping support on for, for XRSDK is talking to that um, sort of already, you know, uh, fairly uh, in intended to be like a cross-platform cross uh, meshing API for Unity. Um, and that's where you can say, you know, hey, do you have any new meshes for me? Um, and then the Unity API handles, you know, talking, talking all the way down to the OpenXR layer. So, um, yeah, those are probably sort of the two main paths that 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 I've used and, and seen used. Um, but uh, yeah, whether you want that slightly more control over things, you can go for the XR mesh subsystem. If you just want to, you know, drag a quick prefab in and get meshes in your scene, uh, AR mesh manager is a, is a pretty reasonable way to go. Um, and and yeah, and a, a special, that is sort of a, a story as far as configuration and things that is still. Um, um, Evolving, uh, where you you may see some changes to the uh, sort of additional settings that you can configure in the mixed reality OpenXR plugin in future releases. It's something that we're continuing to think about um, how like how much control we're able to give uh, developers to configure you know mesh mesh density mesh, the cadence of the mesh um, that sort of thing. So yeah um, yeah AR mesh manager XR mesh subsystem. Uh, and then be on the lookout for additional sort of settings APIs for, to configure that on the uh, Mixed Reality OpenXR plugin side. Yeah. Young lady over there. Uh, so just want to follow up on the previous topic about um, switching from 3D space to 2D screens. So I wonder how much of that is actually working now, because I see on the documentation that it's still experimental on desktop. Um, so yeah, I guess how much of that is actually working and what are the known issues? Yeah, so the, the reason we say that it's experimental is it's not like you can't deploy to other devices, 2D devices today. It's that we don't help with the heavy lifting yet, right? And so, so it's the Unity side of the equation makes it possible to, to do it today, and nothing that I know of breaks. It's just that there's things that there's things that you want to be able to do that that isn't going to be done for you. And so, so our desire is to add the intelligence to say, oh, well, if you want, if 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 it's in a touch environment, we should be doing it this way. And if it's in a you know a poke environment where you're using your hand, it should be done this way, but they should both result in the same the same outcome that you would expect from you know intuiting what you're what what you're supposed to do to interact with what's in front of you. And so the the reason we say it's experimental is we don't Yes, it'll work and it'll deploy. We're not really testing for those devices right now because we don't really add that much value. Um, obviously, there's value in everything we've created, kind of a baseline value. But we're not. We, we, we take hold ourselves to a high standard of, of delivering a lot of real value that works well on that particular device, and we just haven't gotten there yet for the 2D devices. And so, so go have at it. It's not like it doesn't work. It's just that we don't really offer you much extra value that does the magic that makes 2D work as as magically as 3D from the same code base. Yeah, I think the, the, core, um, the core takeaway at, is that currently at the moment, right, um, if you have a button, it'll work in the 3D device or the 2D device. Um, the natural translation, like sort of the design tools, like say you're using PowerPoint and it neatly has all the little margins that like, let you automatically align your text. Those tools aren't yet available in MRTK to neatly translate your 3D like in real space UI to a flat 2D screen UI. Um, the best we can do right now is say, oh, look, you have your camera in that 3D world. When you click on the screen and touch the button, it'll touch. But that's not necessarily as usable. So that's one of our goals is having some sort of intelligent like way to let designers decide how to best translate between the two. Um, but that is you know, one of our higher level goals and not, um, not currently there. It's uh, something we would like to do greatly. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, we've got two people. Uh, we'll try to get through you quickly or try to make sure you can those. Answer. 
Hi, I'm an intern in the Visual Studio team, so and with no experience in in uh, mixed reality, so it's been fascinating to learn about all these tools and especially StereoKit, how easily it, it works with Visual Studio. So it's been really cool. And my question is really like out of personal curiosity, sort of um, being individuals that work so closely and so deeply in mixed reality. What is your relationship with it outside of say like when you're on the clock off off the job? Um, do you use it yourselves? Uh, what are the applications that you use for it? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I feel like at least the obvious one for me is, I don't know, you know, <laughs> VR gaming, right? Like I, I tend to, to run Steam VR a decent amount. Um, I, I don't know. This, I, I tend to go back to older games still. I've played like still working my way through Arizona Sunshine and, and Half-Life Alex and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I also try to uh, just sort of noodle on things. Like I've got a, a handful of just random little apps that you know don't don't do a lot, but just kind of do do one thing that I think is interesting. Um, and so I, yeah, I, uh, I, I I I don't know. Yeah, I definitely just like to noodle in the space, and it's nice when we, uh, when we're able to. Um, you know, sometimes bring back some of that, like, hey, this is something that I kind of wanted to do. Maybe we should uh, make that easier in MRTK, or um, here's some feedback for, you know, Unity. Um, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the, 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 I guess kind of, I mean, the, the, well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. The, the, the kind of, I don't know, ner nerdy thing that I do occasionally. I've, I, I, I'm in a fantasy football league, and it's sometimes fun to like put a hall lens on when you're watching like football on the TV, and then you can put your little edge browser on the side and see your fantasy football scores update in real time. Uh, I, I don't know. I I'm just kind of surprised I just admitted that out loud, but no, that's um, awesome. I was hoping <laughs> to get something like that. But, but that is something. That's like just kind of those fun mixed experiences yeah. that just kind of add value to uh, to the, the to, to what you're doing in the moment. I don't know. Yeah, I'll I'll. Leave it to someone else now. <laughs> um, um, I want to speak for our um, QA um, a engineer, Alex Floyd, who can't be here. But um, he recently got a looking glass. And he actually made it possible for looking glass to, to work with Steam VR. I think it was where he can actually play games on the looking glass. I, I was just blown away. It's like, that is just too cool. The, if you haven't seen the looking glass, it's about this thick. and the craziest thing about it is it literally renders every single frame at like 50 or 60 different perspectives so that no matter which way you look through a Fresnel lens, you're seeing one of those 50, well, two of those 50 perspectives, and it, which is a crazy when, when I think about that. Um, but yeah, so that that is just the kind of like, I just want to, I have this itch, I have this need to, to play with this stuff on the side. I don't, I, I do woodwork. <laughs> Thank well, you. And robots. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? No? All right. Next question. Um, yeah, so I have two questions not really related to one another. Um, but first is related to gestures and stuff. I know with older versions of MRTK, you could create custom gestures for input. Is that something that's going to be handed off to Unity's input system, or is that going to be more specific to MRTK? So um, I know in V2 we had a hand gesture recorder. Um, that is something we have not yet ported to MRTK V3. I think we do have an interest in you know, being able to let users define their own gestures. I think in V2 it was definitely a little bit uh, difficult. Um, I say that because I had to write some unit tests for it, and I was like, oh, I have to like put it on my headset and like save the JSONs. It was like, yeah, it, was, it wasn't the prettiest. Um, but I do think we, we would, um, that's, one, some, that's something I would like us to do more in uh, V3, just kind of have a better way to like define gestures, create more gestures. Um, as far as hanging that off to Unity, that is something that um, I think we'd like to discuss with them. Um, it's something that um, I think is relatively in depth because uh, hand joints are not the same as um, inputs, or they're not like like having a pose is not necessarily recognized as a uh, input by the system. Um, we have some of our things that let you uh, one of our one of our subsystems translates hand joints positions into like a pinch, 
and that is you know that pinch gesture now gets recognized as an input. Um, but obviously that's just a one-off kind of extension of one of our subsystems, um, and it's something we would like to expand out. But it's a very um, I think understandably um, abstract space. There's a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, it's something we're thinking about, but uh, I, I don't know if there is. It is it's it's up there on the you know orders of magnitude difficulty compared to some of the other level level stuff we're trying to ensure currently as far as developing like you know an open standard on Unity side. Anyone else have a comment? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely been an evolving story, right? Like, obviously, Holland's one had, you know, just like a nav what is it, navigation manipulation and air tap was was just about all you could do with um with your hands, and then Holland's two and you know and, and a handful of other devices have now added a actual like hand joint art articulated hand support, and so um it it definitely becomes an opportunity for yeah being able to to create kind of that that um that that ability to to sort of train a model based on hand poses and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's something that we've we found to be successful in, in you know, some cases and still need to work on it for, for others for more very, like, specific poses of hands. Like, for things like, oh, I'm just looking at, like, two joints and trying to see if they're near each other um, becomes a little bit more straightforward. But if you're, you know, uh, trying to, like, detect the Spider-Man pose or something like that, uh, you know, still, 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 sort of noodling on on the best ways to do that across devices and runtimes and things like that. But and I'll and I'll put my business hat on on this and that the two two different points. One is um, we are backed by a massive organization of intelligent designer interaction designers and user researchers and and I mean we as an org uh, we're only a small part of it. And we have so much talent in this org that is thinking about all of these things. And they're constantly experimenting with what's intuitive, what works, what solves this problem, what doesn't work, what, what works across a large variety of uh, demographics and, and what doesn't, and what, what works across cultures and what doesn't. And so you know, thinking big, we're very careful about what we introduce. And then the other perspective it is, um, there's an education component. If, if you come out with a device with 25 different gestures, it's going to fail because people are going to be so confused not knowing how to use this thing. It's going to be like, I, what, what does what? Oh, delete is this? Oh, and then, you know, like you would, and I don't know if you remember the journey of like the iPhone. The iPhone had literally like one thing you could do the first generation, second generation at two, third generation at three, and they just layered in one at a time so they could very slowly and carefully educate the user. But Behind that also was the same thing I was just saying before, which is they're doing similarly doing all that really hard research to make sure that every single thing they introduce meets all of the needs of so many different dimensions of, of requirements. And so we're kind of on the early part of that journey with mixed reality. And yes, over time, we are going to introduce new gestures officially, but that doesn't mean that there won't be a lot of experimentation along the way. Yeah, so user-defined gestures, I think, very viable, um, but it's one of those things where it's like uh, there's a large space and a lot of different ways you can go. You have a second question? Uh, yes. So my second question is, I know there's a lot of um, emphasis on remote rendering and stuff, but a lot of that depends on um, having a more unified or good Wi-Fi connection. And so I'm just curious if there's more emphasis on performance. So I know. Unity is working on a system called ECS, and I'm curious if there's been any experimentation with the MRTK and ECS. I don't think we've done any active experimentation with ECS, but it is it is absolutely um, sort of the whole you know dots tech stack is it's definitely something that I've I I'm personally I'm trying to you know keep on top of and, and make sure that I'm aware of you know when you know. Um, you know uh, that they, when, whenever they have you know their uh, unite videos and panels on on certain pieces of that stack, uh, I'm always very interested in keeping on top of that. Um, yeah, it was, it was it's kind of something we always have in the back of our mind, um, but I, I I don't think at this point we've done a ton of direct experimentation um, with it with with them or TK just yet. But um, starting to think through uh, yeah opportunities to bring some of those things in, but um, very much early days. Yeah. Thank you. Just uh, to add to that, we also have like weekly calls with Unity and their PM. So when they're ready for us to really push into that technology, um, there's 
a lot of communication back and forth between them and us. So we will, um, when they're ready for us to really start pushing into that and making sure we're adopting where they're trying to go for this kind of stuff, um, there's avenues for them to have those communications with us. Uh, to a question from the online chat, um, are there plans to integrate tooling for MR services into MRTK, such as ARR, ASA, uh, or Azure Remote Rendering, Azure Spatial Anchors, and uh, Ad Azure Object Anchors? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can say, you know, there's a, there's a good um, balance between sort of, you know, we've been, we've been starting to think of, of MRTK as, you know, a, a much you know, larger set of packages. And, and we do, you know, work with those teams to help them uh, you know, with their Unity integration and, and get their things packaged, and a handful of those those services that you mentioned are already present on the feature tool. Um, and whether they, you know, have the the big, you know, MRTK banner or are directly shipped by, by like you know this team, um, we are always in conversation with those teams and working to make sure that those packages do work well in Unity. So it's it's always you know it's always an interesting dance of being like you know at least in the the MRTK two world where we were like oh we want to write a data provider for something right. Um, it was always the interesting dance of like well you know what value does a data provider add that just like making just kind of that that feature work really well in Unity um, would would be would be the, the best option and then you don't. You know, um, you don't have to bring in all of MRTK just to get one of those things working. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. We're we're definitely you know working with those teams and making sure that the, those experiences work really well in Unity. Um, uh, yeah, and I just also want to add that um, with MRTK three, we are introducing this new uh, subsystem based architecture. Uh, with that ar architecture, actually, it would be far more easier for. Uh, for example, other Microsoft Teams to release, uh, for example, a Azure-related service that, that can be easily slotted into MRTK3. Um, I guess just for, uh, just for an example, I'm currently testing uh, integrating Azure uh, speech-related, uh, uh, some Azure speech-related uh, services into MRTK. And we already have a prototype working um, you know, all you need to do is to install a package. Like currently, we ship the Windows Speech package that is based on Windows uh, Speech API exposed from Unity. But for example, if we uh, in the later right, the Azure team ships a Azure Speech SDK, you can just easily install that package maybe from the Mixed Reality Feature tool, and then it, uh, in the subsystem list, a new subsystem will just show up. And if you want to use it, you simply check a checkbox and maybe add a config to it. But that's it. So I guess I just want to say that with our new subsystem uh, structure, that would be pretty easy. Pretty easy. And another perspective is that uh, I'm always on the lookout for any opportunity, something that's missing. And uh, you know, one of the things that I um, had um, realized at Object Theory was like that authentication is actually really hard to do well and do it highly securely. And it's like, wouldn't it be cool if the there's an MRTK dropping component that li lights up all of our servers, center multi-tenant, and you know, just makes all the different you know uh, multi-factor and uh, you know uh, device-assisted authentication, all that just magically works because we we've, we've done the heavy lifting and figuring all that out. And you know, there, there's certainly a motivation too. Like the more, with the easier we make it to drop in these services, hopefully the more traction they get, and, and eventually they they. Uh, you know, generate revenues for us, and um, so so those are the kinds of opportunities that we are looking for too to to fill in the gaps of things that aren't actually already being done by other teams at Microsoft, and also just to make them easier to embrace and easier to use. And so um, so authentication is one that I keep coming back to because I remember how hard that was, and I would imagine that a lot of you out there struggle with that as well. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the only opportunity, but that's one that could tie all those together. Another double. Hey, I had a question about. Um, well, I want to guess tell you a, an opinion that I sort of have, and it is that like text input is something that is sort of holding back adoption of a, a lot of the mixed reality XR devices, and I know that with uh, MRTK three. There's been this concerted effort to like solve a lot of the headaches around UI, um, and I was wondering if if you feel like th that that's something that can be solved through you know 
smart you or smart and better UI design, or is it really something that is just going to have to be solved by hardware or um, just using speech? Like that's just the best way to do it. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I got this one. So I, I'm the person basically working, uh, is a person on the team working on keyboard related stuff and also speech related stuff. So I guess I'll start with this. So uh, mixed reality is really a new frontier for all of us. And on this whole new platform, right, like how do you do input is something that we have always been thinking and experimenting with. And with um, MR, uh, with HoloLens 2, right, for example, um, the, the input story is actually much better if you look at the HoloLens one where you, your hand tracking is basically uh, limited to just doing air tap. But for, MR, uh, for HoloLens 2, you can actually like type somewhat more naturally. But, but yeah, I agree with you that uh, input remains or text input remains a very uh, difficult problem uh, we are trying to solve. And from my perspective, I would say, uh, first, uh, we are just trying very hard to continue to provide a good keyboard-based uh, text input experience. Uh, because there are times when you need to use a keyboard. For example, if you are typing in credentials, right? Like, it doesn't work that I just say, hey, uh, my password is 12345. Uh, that's apparently no good. So there are circumstance, <laughs> circumstances where keyboard is not going away. Like we will continue to uh, support our users with a good keyboard experience. And, and just to touch a little bit um, on the topic, uh, it's not only us, but we actually work closely with Unity and uh, with the holographic OS team. Uh, we all work together to make sure that uh, you know you have a good keyboard experience. So uh, so that's one front. And other uh, and on the other front, the speech input. Um, so I feel like in the recent years, speech input has definitely become way more accurate than before. I was. Um, you know, I recently was trying some uh, Azure-based um, speech recognition service, and I was like, oh, this thing is so accurate. So yes, this is something that we are uh, thinking about as well. As I have mentioned, with our subsystem uh, infrastructure, we can easily just add a subsystem that you know handles speech recognition, uh, speech to te text, things like that. So that is also an avenue that we are pursuing. If you ask me if I have a pr preference, I would say, right, it all depends on your um, use case. So for certain use cases, um, keyboard, a virtual keyboard would still be the preferred way. But the, for some other use cases, w uh, speech to text has definitely come a long way that can you know, be a preferred uh, method under certain circumstances. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on maybe some other considerations as far as like text input and selection. So uh, it's not just us on MRTK team. We are also lots of partners, as Hoff mentioned, in our broader MR org, which are looking at things like this. Um, but you know, have you ever considered like you know on your phone how hard it is? That, well, back on the original phones, right? It was really hard to say highlight a word. Now things are much more intelligent. You like hold onto the word, and that word is highlighted. It's easy to use things copy paste. And those problems are also being tackled and solved. And you know. Uh, investigated internally, um, we have a lot of new things, and I think, you know, on MRTK, a lot of the new input modes where we're enabling, like such as gaze and like gaze pinch, um, should make a lot of that like a lot more intelligent. Um, definitely ease up a lot of you know things in there. So I just wanted to point out there's a lot of other things regarding to like text input, um, just like te interaction with large corpuses of words and characters um, that you know is. Whether it's on MR or other devices, they're still being learned, still being investigated. I think swipe on mobile keyboards is only something that was invented in the last like five-ish years. So you know, always we're always improving everywhere. It's not like the keyboard has always been the best and will always be the best. Uh, but yeah, there's a, we we are investigating just you know different ways, and I think because of how MRTK will let you interact with a virtual world in so many more different ways, um, you know, we have a lot of opportunities to investigate and you know figure out what works best. Yeah, and I also just want to say, you know, Max mainly took this this question, and I just kind of want to, I don't know, toot his horn a little bit, because uh, 
text input on HoloLens too, and, and HoloLens one over the years, especially when you're you know triggering the APIs from from Unity. You know the the the, the OS makes advances, Unity makes change, advances, uh, and and sometimes we you know misalignment a little bit. And over the last you know while now, uh, if if you try out this experience in, in sort of much more recent versions of Unity. It is, I think, a, a much more cohesive experience around, you know, getting text input into like a text mesh pro component and that sort of thing. Uh, and the, the, a lot of that has been thanks to this guy right here working, working with Unity and like helping, helping, you know, identify just various scenarios that, 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 that we've seen that, you know, could be better on either side, whether it's on the MRTK side or the Unity side or the OS side. Um, yeah, Max has been has been looking at it all, so it's it's yeah, it's I think has has been much improved from from, you know, previous iterations. Um, but but yeah, always always still room for improvement. But we have another person who's been waiting patiently. Thank you for your patience. Hello, my question has two components. One is um, the first one is synonymously for MRTK. It's actually MRTK for Unity, but everybody uses it nowadays just saying it MRTK, like almost everybody. There's also MRTK for Unreal, so, for example, right? So my question to the team is, what is your vision and providing similar experiences or advancements for other platforms, be it um, Unreal, be it StereoKit, Xamarin, be it uh, Babylon.js? Like, what are your design goals inside Microsoft to provide value there also? The other part of the question is, um, as you said, you're backed by a big organizations, so you have tremendous amount compared to others in engineering resources to work on something like that. How does it impact the community third-party toolkits that may also provide value? Are there any cool things happening that are not like super platform specific, um, but also support mixed reality, for example, that are on your radar that you may be also supporting or that we should also look at to complement MRTK? So, well. I just want to, uh, before entering any deeper questions, reinforce that we are open source. Um, so we do uh, really enjoy our open source community and you know uh, appreciate the contributions they make. And we like working together with them. We actually love working together with them because they help us you know, improve MRDK in ways that we don't even have the capacity for. Like the original M uh, Quest support for MRDK was largely driven by open source community member. So you know we are accepting uh, like any sorts of contributions. We are down to collaborate and you know address any sorts of needs on that front. But I think for the deeper questions, yeah, I'll leave totally. it to Hoff. Yeah, and I would even go further and say, this company is highly supportive of open, open source. We just happen to be the ones on it, actually out there passionately doing it. Um, but there are plenty of other teams across Microsoft that are as well. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think all of you could probably answer what I'm going to answer. But um, I mean, the we, we already are using the MRTK moniker for our Unreal offering. And um, we are. It is kind of we're kind of spearheading the MRTK initiative, and it ends up following. But um, but Unreal is trying to maintain parity with what we're doing, and it just you know one of those ongoing ongoing uh, journeys on that side as well. I don't think we'll. I mean, Stereokit has such a good brand of its own. I don't think we would put it under our, our moniker, but it certainly is offering similar types of capabilities, and it ties back to the whole you know one MRTK philosophy of you know shared design language, the uh, mixed reality design language is currently being put into MRTK Unreal. Um, so yeah, we, we, we feel like we've got a, a, a good brand, and, and we do want to continue to um, spread the goodness. Does that answer your question? Uh, anyone else in the We have another person up front? Are there any nuggets you can share about MRTK3 and uh, support for the Mesh SDK? Uh, and while we're on that topic, HoloLens 3 or new hardware? Everyone's thinking it, so I might as well ask it. We, we cannot talk about future. That, that, is, that is not my area of expertise. That is not my area of expertise. Uh, yeah. That's um, above my pay grade. Unfortunately, <laughs> Any yeah. one of those, take your pay. Uh, we, yeah, that, yeah, there's really nothing we could say on those fronts. So another one from the uh, Learn TV audience. Uh, is there any plans to give better access to the MRTK hand mesh to drive that from other data sources? Uh, 
Well, there's, there's two aspects of this, right? There's the hand mesh generated by Holland, yeah. and then there's... Uh, yeah, we've, we've well, kind of got in, in MRTK2, right? We, we and, and, and yeah, <laughs> I was looking at Roger because he you know, he, he's actively working on bringing some of this to MRTK3. Right, in MRTK2, we had sort of the, the, the rigged hand mesh for devices that don't directly provide a a tracked mesh, but is something that can be driven by the hand joint data, right? Um, some devices like Holland's 2 actually provide like an active mesh that you can query every frame and, and kind of render, um, you know, update a Unity mesh with with that new data every frame. Um, so yeah, it's 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 sort of a piece that fits into the greater puzzle of just visualization of input, right? Which I think you know controller render models fit under as well, um, and and just kind of arbitrary visualizations of data. And so yeah, we're we're kind of working on a. a a slightly more sort of extensible version of that for MRTK3 um, that, 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 yeah, uh, should open the door for, for potentially you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember if the question was they wanted to put their own data in or if they wanted to use that data for other reasons, but I think it, it should support kind of both, whether you have your own opinion of, of what the, the mesh data should be driven by um, or you just want to access that data and do something novel with it. Yeah, rigged hand meshes like they're, 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 that's being being brought back into MRTK three. So you will have you know your rigged hand scene. It should be um, improved a bit actually. So you know a little bit less janky in some ways um, is what we've been trying to do. Um, but I think one thing you'll appreciate about the MRTK um, like rig in general is that a lot of the things you want in the scene are going to actually be inside the you know actually Unity engine. You won't have to like hope that your model pops up and like hook into some visualization script that we prescribe. Uh, so that should all be a lot smoother. Um, I think in MRTK2 in our latest update, we introduced some controller models. Um, those will also be brought into MRTK3. And you know, all of that stuff is all in service of making life easier for the developer to you know, just get started on your application and feel like, yes, I am in the scene. You know, these things in my hand that I'm wielding around are things that um, exist rather than, I hope they exist. I hope nothing broke. We're getting close to the end. Does anyone have any final questions? Oh, Sean over here. Easier question this time. <laughs> uh, so OpenXR, so if I developed a eye tracking application, let's say in a year, MetaQuest comes out with eye tracking on their quest, would that automatically be supported as far as you're aware? Uh, so yeah, so eye, eye tracking is 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 something that has a cross vendor approved extension in OpenXR today, um, and so yeah, uh, you know if they they add that support to their hardware, they they connect that you know feature extension through their runtime. Um, we are just reading data out uh, through the Unity input system um, from that OpenXR extension, and so yeah, any data that flows through there. Um, it should should just light up in MRTK3, yeah. And not only will your eyes be tracked, you'll be able to you know interact using our nice eye, in, eye gaze interaction. So you know you can uh, you can you can force grab even more better than you can currently. Yeah, yeah, and I, don't know. <laughs> I feel like we we I, I I try to you know emphasize this in the the previous talk as well, but that is just one of the the pieces that I am so excited about about our adoption of the Unity input system and, and OpenXR is that yeah. You know, when there is this this approved OpenXR extension for something like eye tracking, it doesn't matter what you know hardware exists at the moment you publish that app. Like as long as future runtimes and future devices conform to that existing spec, it just it just works. Uh, it's it's cool. One more. Okay. Oh boy, I love overtime. Um, uh, just kind of in the same vein of just like um these interaction profiles. So something I haven't really heard much about at, at this conference, or maybe just because the hardware is not there yet, is like haptics, so like vests, data gloves, things like that. Does MRTK plan to have any support for things like that, like in the future? Or like, you know, like even like body track, like slime VR, or like things like that. Like, are those part of OpenXR even, before we can even talk about MRTK? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think definitely stuff like that. Um, I'll say, yeah, we ha we haven't today done a ton of investigation into things like that. But I think as as stuff like that comes online, like that 
that 100% like, you know, anything that can add a bit of that, like, you know, there's tactile feedback or whatever from, from the interactions that we're enabling. Like, I think 100% it, it makes sense for us to look into, you know, get, getting that like physical feedback on your finger when you poke a button or something like that. Um, I, I can't speak specifically for, you know, the, the, the open XR spec and, th and where things are, are, you know, whether they're supported today or, or not in certain vendor runtimes or, or where that's going. But I think we are always on the lookout for things like that when, you know, when certain hardware comes online or certain things start, start happening in the industry. Um, anything that can, can accrue value to, to these interactions, I think, is definitely something we, we, we are interested in. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're at time. Thank you, everyone. We'll be outside after the session if you guys have any more questions. And for our online viewers, um, just reach out to us on Hollow Developer Slack, GitHub, or Twitter if you have any follow-ups. We're really excited to hear from you guys. And thanks for all your awesome questions. You weren't too hard on us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>